Hello everyone, well, back to the into the Gazza Vid Sunday Roundup. So this is your uh, regular weekly eclectic mix of this and that um, for your Sunday uh, lunchtime and afternoon uh, viewing pleasure. So we're going to have a look at uh, solar activity. We'll have a look at what's happening in the oceans. We'll look at and, and to see what's happening in the stratosphere. Uh, and a few other bits and bobs as well. And we'll focus on next week's 10 days. The uh, midnight run of the GFS brought back the beast from the east in a week's time. It has bitterly cold easterly winds and uh, the risk of some snow moving back in from the east. We'll see the latest on that. Um, I'll show you the charts uh, towards the end of the video. You'll be able to see the, G the GM and the ECMWF uh, on that as well. This evening we might do an ensembles watch uh, to see what the GFS ensembles are showing for this chance of bringing back the beast from the east in around a week's time. But we'll begin by having a look at what's happening with the uh, sun and solar activity. Just to say that today's first video was the um, analogs update for the summer. You can find that video here on the homepage. It's just above the uh, snow desk. We're focusing uh, this week for part one of our summer 2018 analogs. We're focusing on uh, cold Februarys and the summers that follow them. So uh, have a look and uh, see what uh, the cold February we just had could mean. Uh, for the summer. There'll be many more analogs updates over the next few uh, weeks and couple of months. And as I say, that video will be placed on the summer 2018 uh, forecast and updates page later on today with a written uh, post as well going over everything discussed in the video. Right, let's get on with your sunny roundup. We're going to begin with the uh, sun. So this is what's happening uh, on the solar disk, on our side of this today, from soham.net, uh, we've got a spotless sun. Apparently, there's been five days of um, no sunspots, spotless condition on the solar disk. And uh, consequently, solar activity with Soham is designated as being at very low levels. And it is expected to stay at very low levels over the next three days as well. This is the Gazwell Bid Sunday Roundup Solar Activity Tracker. This is just updated uh, to yesterday by our good friend James Ackrell. Big thank James for keeping this update and sending, sending it through to us every week as always. So um, let's just scroll down a little bit so you can see where we are. This is where we are uh, right now. We are actually trending downwards a little bit with the uh, trend lines. So the orange line here is depicting everyday solar activity um, go right way back to uh, last year and go all the way back to April uh, 2017 uh, with the solar tracker. Um, and we've been at a very low level of uh, solar activity really since uh, the autumn. Uh, I mean, we got, had a big spike in activity at the beginning of September with sunspot numbers shooting up. But then very quickly there was a crash. And uh, really since October we've been at this sort of minimal uh, level of um, solar activity. Not at solar minimum yet. That won't be, uh, we won't reach that stage for around another uh, year or so. But we are at a minimal level of uh, solar activity. Uh, now you can see we're just trading uh, days really. So some days we do have a small level of uh, sunspots and you can see that depicted by the orange spikes. Uh, but other days we have no sunspots at all and we are increasingly stringing together several days in succession uh, with uh, no sunspots. And so that's beginning to move the thick green and the thick red lines, which are the trend lines, um, ever downwards. So we are increasingly moving down to a lower and lower level of um, solar activity as we string together more and more days with uh, no sunspots. When we arrive at true solar minimum in around a year, uh, a year's time, uh, we will get several weeks probably, if not uh, maybe even months, of no sunspots whatsoever. The reason we look at su uh, sunspots and solar activity is that there's a connection between uh, minimal levels of uh, solar activity, uh, and particularly around and just after solar minimum, and an increased risk of uh, northern blocking. So at this point in the solar cycle, uh, we increase the chance of northern blocking through the winter. Interestingly, we did get um, northern blocking this winter, uh, particularly late on. We have the Scandinavian high unleashing the beast from the east. Um, so at this point in the solar cycle, uh, we are increasing the risk through the winters anyway 
of northern blocking and consequently the risk of uh, colder conditions. It's not a guarantee to anything. There's never a guarantee uh, with the weather, but it's almost like loading the dice in favour of a particular outcome. In this instance, it's loading the dice in favour of um, winter northern blocking and an increased risk of uh, colder winters consequently. We will continue to monitor solar activity uh, through the next few weeks and months during the Gazrovi Sunday Roundup. Uh, this is what's happening in the oceans. This is very, the very latest in terms of the uh, sea surface temperature anomalies in the uh, oceans, specifically um, focusing on the Pacific and Atlantic Oceans. So we're continuing to see the weakening of La Nina. Let's deal with that first of all. That's the equatorial Pacific Ocean uh, just there. We do still have the signature of La Nina here in the central part of the equatorial Pacific Ocean, but you'll see that from the eastern side, from the Peruvian side, um, we are seeing a further weakening of that La Nina uh, signature, and it looks, looks like it's also weakening over on the Indonesian side as well. So from both sides, it's kind of like being nibbled away at those uh, cold and average sea surface temperature, temperature anomalies. But they do persist in that central part of the uh, equatorial Pacific. But I think within the next um, month or so, we should see that signal finally beginning to fade away. One of the areas I always focus on uh, to see what may happen going forwards is around the coast of Chile. So this area uh, just here. Um, and you see we've sort of run out of uh, cold sea surface temperature anomalies down there. When the La Nina was beginning to get itself together back at the end of last summer, um, this was very cold down here with the sea surface temperature anomalies. We had a lot of blue. Now those have gone. Uh, you wouldn't necessarily say they've, um, we've got warmer than average sea surface temperature anomalies there. So it's not really a signal at the moment for El Nino to be starting to uh, gather pace. But certainly we're running out of colder than average sea surface temperature anomalies, which is telling me that this La Nina was a weak La Nina anyway, but this La Nina is probably almost done. And uh, by the time we get through to the end of the spring and into the start of the summer, it will be a case, I think we'll be back to end so neutral then, and it will be a case of seeing where we go from there into the second half of the year. We are at the spring predictability barrier now, which means uh, the modelling particularly uh, struggles to see where things are going to go from this point onwards through to the rest of uh, the year. So once we get to around May or June, the models will begin to latch on to uh, where we're probably going to go um, as we get into the second half of uh, this year in terms of ENSO. Not always the case, because you'll remember last summer, at the start of last summer, uh, all of the model output and all of the uh, signals were for us to go into an El Nino event uh, for the winter of 2017-18. Actually, at the very end of the summer, into the start of the autumn, that El Nino collapsed, and we went into a landing your cold event. So you, you can never really guarantee where things are going to go in terms of end. So, but we should have a clearer idea by the time we get through to the uh, start of the summer. Uh, further north in the Pacific Ocean, very little change. It's generally quite uh, warm. We've seen some temperature anomalies in this western uh, portion of the uh, northern Pacific. Over on the eastern portion of the northern Pacific, it's quite cold on that coast between uh, Canada and uh, North America. In the Atlantic, again, very little change. Notice how cold the sea surface temperature anomalies are now around the UK, Ireland, sort of Biscayne down into the Mediterranean. And really, really cold in the southern North Sea. That's left over from uh, the beast from the east, of course. So at the moment, SSTs are well below average around the UK. Bear in mind, those are very shallow waters. And as soon as we get a warm or hot spell of weather, those um, blue colours will disappear and they'll swing uh, well, if we was to if we was to sustain uh, a hot spell, those um, blue colours would go to red, and they would go significantly warmer than average. These um, shallow waters that we have around the UK and in the Med and in the Bay of Biscay off the coast of Portugal, they are prone to very dramatic uh, changes as the uh, surface temperature above um, changes. In the deeper waters of the Atlantic Ocean, we see that uh, to the south of Greenland, 
uh, it's a little bit cooler than average. Uh, otherwise, just quite close to average, really, with BC's uh, temperature dominance in the Atlantic at, mo at the moment. They have cooled down a little bit compared to where they were at the start of uh, the summer. Up in the nor uh, start of winter, I should say. Up in the Norwegian Sea, um, there it's very warm, you'll remember, back in the autumn with VC sub temperature anomalies. Still warmer than average, but less so than uh, a few months ago. Right, moving on to what's happening in the stratosphere. This is the latest from the JMA in terms of temperature at 30 HPA over the uh, North Pole. The uh, grey line here is the trend line for the time of year. The black line tells us where we've been and where we are with those um, temperatures at 30 HPA, which is kind of like one of the top levels of the atmosphere in the stratosphere. So uh, we have the sun stratospheric warming, of course, back at the uh, end of January and into the start of February. I think the actual date for the sun stratospheric warming was the 12th of February, um, which led us to the increased blocking signal and led us to the uh, beast from the east in the final week of uh, February. Since that uh, sun stratospheric warming at 30 HPA, we've been seeing the temperature gradually lowering. This is where we are uh, right now at a much cooler level, but still a little bit above average, interestingly, a little bit above the uh, grey line uh, for the time of the year. I suspect within the next few weeks we will get one final sun stratospheric warming, and that should uh, then um, spell sort of the death now for the polar vortex as we go into the summer. But at the moment... We're still a bit warmer than average at 30 HPA, but um, we're not as warm as we was when we had the stratospheric warming. A little bit further up to 10 HPA, we've actually got a little bit cooler than average. Again, same idea, the black line tells us where we've been with stratospheric temperatures at 10 HPA over North Pole this season. The grey line is the trend line. So we did get a warming at 10 HPA as well when we had that sudden stratospheric warming. Less dramatic at 10 HPA than it was at 30 uh, HPA. And this is where we are right now. Actually, yeah, it's a slightly cooler than average, a, a little bit under the grey line um, for uh, the temperature at 10 HPA. So the temperatures are lowering at the moment over the uh, North Pole, and particularly so at uh, 10 HPA. This is how the ECMWF via the University of Berlin website is forecasting uh, temperatures to progress uh, over the uh, next 10 days at 30 HPA over North Pole. The black uh, cross here is the uh, actual North Pole of the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, so you see that uh, at 30 HPA in 96 hours, which is the 14th of March, we've got these blue colours in uh, over pretty much the whole of the Northern Hemisphere, but, but particularly over the uh, North Pole. So uh, it's a little bit cooler, uh, uh, a little bit cooler than average, really, uh, by the time you get through to the middle of the coming week. Uh, moving through to uh, 168 hours, very little change. There's a bit of a warming sign to take place over towards uh, Russia and Siberia, just there um, at 30 HPA. But generally, the blue colours are still uh, there over the North Pole. And then that takes us to uh, day 10, uh, which is uh, 20th of March. Uh, again, temperature at 30 HPA looks pretty cool. So there's no sign of a renewed uh, sun stratospheric warming at the moment. In terms of the wind fluxes and uh, the zonal winds, so this is how uh, things look. We have the reversal of the zonal winds, of course. See that with this blue line going negative. Um, again, this is from the University of Berlin website. You find a link to this website. Excellent website. You find a link to it uh, on the links page. Uh, so we went negative with the zonal winds and fluxes uh, back in February. That's when we had the sudden stratospheric warming. So we had a reversal of the zonal winds. That's one of the factors that created the uh, blocking you can't keep the uh, zonal winds uh, negative for a, a prolonged period. So we did see the zonal winds going back to weekly positive territory. Um, we have seen that over the past uh, couple of weeks. That's where we are right now, weekly positive. And the black line, um, that's the forecast from the ECWF model. And we are forecast to stay at this weekly positive level with the zonal winds and fluxes. Maybe signs of a little bit of a dip right at the end again. Um, but overall, it looks like we are uh, fairly stable with the zonal winds and fluxes for the time being 
and we're in sort of weekly positive territory. At that sort of level, it doesn't preclude the chance of getting uh, more non-blocking. We're not at this sort of level, uh, where we were at back at the end of December. That was very strong zone of winds then, and uh, we increased the westerlies quite dramatically at the end of December and into January. And if we were at that level, then it would very much um, push against the chance of getting uh, renewed blocking. But at the level we're at right now, it uh, is it's a weak level for the zone of winds, and so you could expect um, perhaps the chance of uh, more blocking at times. Arctic Oscillation observed and forecast chart looks like this. So the black line tells us where we've been with the Arctic Oscillation. The red lines at the end where the GFS symbol is forecasting the Arctic Oscillation to go. Remember, it's just an index that's reflecting the state of the action. It's not driving anything. It just tells you what the atmosphere is doing. So as we have the sudden stratospheric warming, we reverse the zonal winds uh, and we created the northern blocking. And you can see... When that happened via the dip in the black line here into very negative territory. So that's when the northern blocking force, the Arctic Oscillation, remember it's always the weather that drives the index. So it was the high pressure forming over Scandinavia and up into the Arctic that drove the Arctic Oscillation uh, very negative. We did see a real crash in the Arctic Oscillation at the end of February into the start of March. We're still significantly neg uh, negative, below average, with the Arctic Oscillation right now. That's where we are. Uh, and the GFS ensemble is generally forecasting us to stay at this negative level through into the second half of March. A few ensemble members do start to lift the uh, Arctic Oscillation back into positive territory, but they're outliers at the moment. And generally, the thrust of the uh, GFS ensembles is to keep the Arctic Oscillation in negative territory. So at that sort of level, again, you could possibly possibly uh, get some more northern blocking beginning to return onto our side uh, of the pole. It's certainly not out of the question that that could happen into the second half of March. North Atlantic Oscillation, very similar. Again, the black line tells where we've been with the North Atlantic Oscillation. Red lines at the end where GF Sobble's forecasting the North Atlantic Oscillation to go. So, again, you can see when we went negative with the uh, NAO, um, at, you know, so at the same time as the uh, AO went negative, as we have that blocking setting up over Scandinavia and the uh, North Pole. Through most of the winter, the NAO uh, was positive. You can see that um, through that period just there. We expected a positive NAO uh, this winter. Um, and it's one of the factors why we haven't had an especially cold winter. Whilst it has been a colder winter, uh, most definitely, we have had more snow than any winter since 2012, 2013, won't be remembered as a very cold winter. And the main reason for that is that the Atlantic has always been set up, till the very end of winter anyway, always been set up for westerly. So we've kind of like had blocking fighting against uh, west. We've had the Arctic in a negative state and the uh, Atlantic in a positive state. They've been fighting against one another all winter till the very end where they both came into sync. They both went very negative and that's when we unleashed the coldest spell of the uh, winter via the beast from the east. In terms of the forecast of the NAO, uh, Jeff S. Sommels just want to keep it uh, close to neutral but on the negative side. So there's no sign that uh, we're going to strengthen the uh, zonal signal through the second half of March, particularly uh, generally staying around neutral to a little bit uh, weakly negative. Right, these are the GFS ensembles for uh, the next couple of weeks. The uh, red line here is the 30-year upper air temperature average. We're looking at London uh, today. So this is where we are right now, a little bit milder than average. It's uh, quite a pleasant sort of mothering Sunday, actually, especially for non parts country. There will be some rain coming up down in the south, however. Uh, over the rest of the week, we're going to say generally quite mild um, with those upper air temperatures. But from the weekend, this is the 17th of March just here. And from there... We're beginning to see a few cold outliers beginning to appear. So look at these ensemble members that are dipping into very negative, or very cold, um, upper air temperature territory. Going again down to between minus 10 and minus 15, uh, 850 HPA. Included in that is the green line, that thick green line, which is the uh, operational run of the GFS, the midnight run. I'm going to show you that uh, very shortly because it does unleash the beast from the east again uh, in around a week's time. 
Um, you can see it's not all that well supported by BGFS ensembles. Most ensemble members are still up here in this period. So it's a low chance that we're going to get these easterly winds, I think, in terms of what the GFS ensembles are showing. Anyway, but the risk is there. And we know that from the last build-up to the beast this is kind of like how things developed. Uh, so at the start, it was just like the operational runs that were picking up on the easterly wings. Then a few ensemble members went with the operational run, uh, and then a few more ensemble members went with the operational run until eventually we locked in to uh, agreement with um, the easterly wings coming in. So this is kind of like how the last easterly started in some ways. But just because that's how things develop with the last easterly doesn't necessarily guarantee that's how things will develop with uh, this easterly. As I say, this evening, I think we'll go through the GFS ensembles, doing ensembles watch and see just how much support there is for bringing in easterly wings. Uh, later on in the ensemble, it does look as though we have got uh, most ensemble members going quite cold there. I'm not sure what they're doing. Maybe a lot of those are pulling down northerly winds. As this risk of building up the high pressure over Scandinavia is growing, so the signal for um, the second half of March to be very wet has weakened a little bit. Now, you have got quite a lot of precipitation spikes uh, here on this ensemble graph, but not as many as we were seeing a few days ago. So whilst we are going to be in, particularly over the next week, for some bouts of quite heavy rain, maybe not quite the very wet signal for the second half of March that we were seeing a couple of days ago. And the reason for that is that the Scandinavian high, if it does get going, will start to block off the Atlantic once again. Temperature anomalies for uh, the weekend is going from the 11th to the 19th of March. are coming out around, or maybe a little bit above average for England and Wales, close to average for Scotland. Notice Scandinavia is colder than average. And if this Scandinavian high does get going next weekend, you can expect to see these anomaly charts trending cold uh, once again. Precipitation anomalies for the 11th to 19th of March look like that. And it's generally going to be quite a wet uh, week coming up for much of Western Europe, northern and west part of Scotland are coming out a bit dry and average, but most of the UK and Ireland actually a little bit on the wet and average side. I'd say this isn't quite as wet a signal as we were seeing a few days ago, but it is still an unsettled signal, certainly in the next week. Notice again, very wet for Spain and for Portugal as well. So if you know anybody that's going on holiday or is on holiday at the moment down in Spain, it could be really wet uh, down there in the week ahead. A bit of a washout. Take your um, waterproofs if you're heading down there. Of course, they they love it down in Spain. They love any rain they can get because very shortly the Spanish uh, summer will be getting going and uh, it doesn't rain across many inland parts of Spain anyway for uh, many weeks and months through the course of the summer. So any rain they can get, uh, they'll be very welcome for it. Right, let's have a look at that GFS run then. So this is uh, the midnight run of the GFS. We know from the ensembles that it's going to be a cold run. This is how we start on Thursday. We've got high pressure uh, trying to build over Scandinavia, low pressure to the southwest of Ireland, and we're bringing up these southerly winds. Be wet and quite windy uh, on Thursday. That's to Friday. Notice the uh, Scandinavian high is strengthening with the low pressure out to the west of Ireland. And then on Saturday, uh, the Scandinavian high strengthens further. It's up to 1,040 millibars, and it's beginning to orientate itself in a way that is starting to bring those easterly winds flooding back in across northern Europe. At this point, those easterly winds still haven't got to us. We are still mild with the wind journey from a southerly direction. Uh, around this area of low pressure, but look how cold it is across Scandinavia and northeastern parts of Europe with those upper air temperatures. Now, by Sunday, look at that. This is a week uh, a week today, so the 18th of March. The Scandinavian high is taking over the pattern, and it is turning winds into the east. We're already bringing in an easy wind into eastern parts of the UK. There's the upper air temperatures, very cold upper air temperatures again across many northern parts of Europe. This is very similar to what happened at the end of February. And those very cold upper air temperatures are starting 
to head our way. So by the time we get through to Monday, just a little bit beyond a week away, this is Monday 19th of March, look at that, we're in an easterly wind and we're dragging in those very cold upper air temperatures as well. So pushing for minus 10 isotherm through the country yet again and temperatures are going a little bit colder than that over to the east. Not as cold with the upper air temperatures as we had uh, at the end of February because we're later on into the year so it can be harder uh, and further on into the year we go it can be harder to get those extreme cold upper air temperatures but for the time of year 19th of March that is a very impressively cold chart in terms of the upper air temperatures and it would be cold enough to be bringing in more snow from the east as well so we're off and running again into a very cold spell and this takes us up to uh, Tuesday 20th of March but again easterly winds they're unstable there's kinks in the ice bars so it's bitterly cold and more snow showers coming in from the east there's the upper air temperatures they look really impressively cold for so late into uh, March and that's how we go to day 10 still looking pretty cold although we're beginning to cut off the worst of those east winds this high pressure starts to sink down in towards uh, Scotland. The upper air temperatures are still impressively cold for the time of year, but not quite as cold as before that. And then the high pressure just kind of sinks down over the UK. It will be very frosty, but uh, cutting off that easterly supply. But that is the beast from the east, part two, being predicted by the GFS this morning. Uh, what about the GM? This is a Canadian model, and this has us in a mild and wet southerly wind for Thursday into Friday and Saturday. The high pressure is building over Scandinavia, not as strongly as the um, as the GFS does it, though. However, by sunny 18th of March, we are beginning to turn the winds into the east to some degree. And uh, by Monday 19th, we are actually pulling in an east-northeasterly wind. Not as much of a Scandinavian high as the GFS is showing. So because of that, actually the upper air temperatures are much less cold. Whilst that would be a pretty raw and grim east wind, it would drag in a lot of cloud, a lot of damp weather, maybe some sleet and wet snow for northern parts of the country as well. It's nowhere near as cold uh, with those east winds as the GFS is uh, showing for the end of next weekend and into the following week. But nevertheless, it's trending in the same sort of direction. We go up to day 10, and uh, very quickly, we're starting to reintroduce a westerly flow of the Atlantic becoming milder. So that's just a little cold snap. It's not particularly cold, just very grim, really. Raw easterly winds, lots of cloud, damp weather uh, on the east coast. And then the east MWF looks like that. The Thursday, again, the low pressure's out to west of Ireland with those wet and windy southerly winds. Into next weekend, we're building the Scandinavian high up. The low pressure's out to the west of Ireland. There's a real battle taking place between these two air masses. There's the upper air temperatures for Saturday, looking generally uh, mild across most parts of the country, but really cold upper air temperatures just on the other side of the North Sea over Scandinavia and Northern Europe. However, we don't get the easterly wind with the uh, with this morning's ECM. The uh, Scandinavian high actually starts to collapse. So by Sunday, the 18th of March, the cold upper air temperatures are beginning to slip down in towards the southeast of Europe. And we maintain generally quite mild air from off the Atlantic. And then into the extended range of the ECM, we return uh, the westerly winds. So we don't get any cold weather. We don't get any cold easterly winds with uh, this morning's ECMWF. The only thing I'll say about that finally is that these are the ECM ensembles for DeBilt in uh, Holland. And uh, you can see the red line here is that operational run of the ECM WF that we're just looking at. But you can see that in in the extended range of that run, which is this period just here, um, the operational run of the ECM was just about the warmest ensemble member ensemble member. It finished up as one of the warmest ensemble members. It looks like it was a bit of a warm out outlayer, a bit of a mild outlayer uh, for DeBilt. Remember if you get easterly wings then DeBilt is going to get the cold air first. Okay, let's just check to make sure we're recording. Yes, we are. So that's the uh, phone answer. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, the uh, operational run of the ECM uh, looks like it was possibly a mild outlier compared to its other ensemble members. As I was saying, if we get those wings into the uh, east, um, what we're going to find is that the build gets the cold air first before the UK. So I think it's all a little bit to be determined. 
uh, to be honest. Um, there's certainly the risk that we could get a, a beast from the East Part 2 uh, here. Uh, and we're just going to have to wait a couple more days to see whether... Um, that high pressure does build properly over Scandinavia, as that uh, GFS run is showing, or where it all goes a bit flimsy and uh, never really gets those easterlies in, as uh, particularly the East End US shows, albeit it is certainly a warmer option within its ensemble. So it's a case of watch this space, I think, on that. But, of course, as I've been explaining... The uh, atmosphere hasn't recovered yet from that sudden stratospheric warming, or it hasn't recovered properly. It's tried to recover, uh, and it has recovered to some degree, um, but it hasn't fully recovered. Uh, and anyway, as we're going into further into the spring, we always increase the chance of Easters and Scandinavian highs anyway. So by the time you get through to May, we will almost certainly have a prolonged period of easy winds at some point through May, because we nearly always do. But by then, there'll be no cold air over Russia to drag in. Um, but the point is that as we go further into spring, so the chance of easy winds continue. And because of what's happened with the stratospheric warming and the atmosphere not being fully recovered, there is the chance that we might bring in some quite unusually cold air again at some point within the next week or two. So we do have to keep a close eye out for it. Right, that's your Sunday roundup uh, today. Telephone call interruptions <laughs> included. Um, don't forget to check out the uh, part one of the summer 2018 analogues. And uh, as I say, this evening, we'll have a look at the uh, GFS ensembles, see how much support there is within the G GFS for uh, bringing in another beast from the east in around a week's time. But at uh, 31 minutes, that's all for now. And thanks for watching.